a masterpiece of enigmatic nature, an intricate tapestry of roots intricately interwoven. Only Mother Nature, the blind weaver, could create such a tangle. A complex sphere with a thousand meticulous knots, the epitome of natural complexity, the human brain. As man's physical body has five distinct and important extremities, two legs, two arms and a head, of which the last governs the first four, the number five has been accepted as the symbol of man. By its four comers, the pyramid symbolizes the arms and legs, and by its apex, the head, thus indicating that one rational power controls four irrational corners. The hands and feet are used to represent the four elements, of which the two feet are earth and water, and the two hands, fire and air. The brain then symbolizes the sacred fifth element, ether, which controls and unites the other four. If the feet are placed together and the arms outspread, man then symbolizes the cross with the rational intellect as the head or upper limb. While all the mysteries recognize the heart as the center of spiritual consciousness, they often purposely ignored this concept and used the heart in its exoteric sense as the symbol of the emotional nature. In this arrangement, the generative center represented the physical body, the heart, the emotional body, and the brain, the mental body. The brain represented the superior sphere, but after the initiates had passed through the lower degrees, they were instructed that the brain was the proxy of the spiritual flame dwelling in the innermost recesses of the heart. The student of esotericism discovers ere long that the ancients often resorted to various blinds to conceal the true interpretations of their mysteries. The substitution of the brain for the heart was one of these blinds. The secret doctrine declares that every part and member of the body is epitomized in the brain and, in turn, that all that is in the brain is epitomized in the heart. In symbolism, the human head is frequently used to represent intelligence and self-knowledge. As the human body in its entirety is the most perfect known product of the Earth's evolution, it was employed to represent divinity, the highest appreciable state or condition. Artists attempting to portray divinity often show only a hand emerging from an impenetrable cloud. The cloud signifies the unknowable divinity concealed from man by human limitation. The hand signifies the divine activity, the only part of God which is cognizable to the lower senses. Then, came the age of idolatry. The mysteries decayed from within. The secrets were lost, and none knew the identity of the mysterious man who stood over the altar. It was remembered only that the figure was a sacred and glorious symbol of the universal power, and it finally came to be looked upon as a god, the one in whose image man was made. Having lost the knowledge of the purpose for which the mannequin was originally constructed, the priests worshipped this effigy until at last their lack of spiritual understanding brought the temple down in ruins about their heads and the statue crumbled with the civilization that had forgotten its meaning. It would take epochs before the mysteries surfaced again into public consciousness, concealed within Carl Jung's revolutionary psychological theories. Behind the tapestry of Jung's modern insights lies the enigmatic Red Book. For many years, the Red Book remained unpublished and was stored in a bank vault. It was finally released to the public in 2009, almost 50 years after Jung's death. The publication of the Red Book provided scholars, psychologists, and the general public with insights into Jung's personal journey and the development of his ideas. The book is a rich and complex work that delves into the depths of Jung's own psyche. 
It contains his reflections on the nature of the unconscious, encounters with symbolic figures and archetypal images, and explorations of his own psychological and spiritual development. Jung saw the process of creating the Red Book as a form of active imagination and a means of integrating the various aspects of his unconscious. In the second part of the book, Liber Secundus, chapter The Magician, Jung undergoes a visionary journey that plumbs the profound depths of the symbol within the human brain. Let us immerse ourselves in his writings, extracting the concealed wisdom therein. What new arts do you bear up from the inaccessible treasure chamber, the sun yoke from the egg of the gods? You still have roots in the soil like plants, and you are animal faces of the human body. You are foolishly sweet, uncanny, primordial, and earthly. We cannot grasp your essence, you gnomes, you abject souls. You have your origin in the lowest. Do you want to become giants, you Tom Thumbs? Do you belong to the followers of the Son of the Earth? Are you the earthly feet of the Godhead? What do you want? Speak! We come to greet you as the master of the lower nature. Are you speaking to me? Am I your master? You are not, but you are now. So you declare, and so be it. Yet what should I do with your following? We carry what is not to be carried from below to above. We are the juices that rise secretly, not by force, but sucked out of inertia and affixed to what is growing. We know the unknown ways and the inexplicable laws of living matter. We carry up what slumbers in the earthly, what is dead and yet enters into the living. We do this slowly and easily, what you do in vain in your human way. We complete what is impossible for you. What should I leave to you? Which troubles can I transfer to you? What should I not do, and what do you do better? You forget the lethargy of matter. You want to pull up with your own force what can only rise slowly, ingesting itself, affixed to itself from within. Spare yourself the trouble, or you will disturb our work. Should I trust you, you untrustworthy ones, you slaves and slave souls? Get to work, let it be so. It seems to me that I gave you a long time. Neither did I descend to you, nor did I disturb your work. I lived in the light of day, and did the work of the day. What did you do? We hauled things up, we built, we placed stone upon stone. Now you stand on solid ground. I feel the ground more solid, I stretch upward. We forged a flashing sword for you, with which you can cut the knot that entangles you. I take the sword firmly in my hand, I lift it for the blow. We also place before you the devilish, skillfully twined knot that locks and seals you. Strike, only sharpness will cut through it. Let me see it, the great knot, all wound round. Truly a masterpiece of inscrutable nature, a wily, natural tangle of roots grown through one another. Only Mother Nature, the blind weaver, could work such a tangle. A great snarled ball and a thousand small knots, all artfully tied, intertwined, truly, a human brain. Am I seeing straight? What did you do? You set my brain before me. Did you give me a sword so that its flashing sharpness slices through my brain? What were you thinking of? The womb of nature wove the brain. The womb of the earth gave the iron. So the mother gave you both entanglement and severing. Mysterious, do you really want to make me the executioner of my own brain? It befits you as the master of the lower nature. Man is entangled in his brain, and the sword is also given to him to cut through the entanglement. What is the entanglement you speak of? The entanglement is your madness. The sword is the overcoming of madness. You offsprings of the devil who told you that I am mad, 
You earth spirits, you roots of clay and excrement, are you not yourselves the root fibers of my brain? You polyp-snared rubbish, channels for juice knotted together, parasites upon parasites, all sucked up and deceived, secretly climbing up over one another by night. You deserve the flashing sharpness of my sword. You want to persuade me to cut through you? Are you contemplating self-destruction? How come nature gives birth to creatures that she herself wants to destroy? Do not hesitate. We need destruction since we ourselves are the entanglement. He who wishes to conquer new and brings down the bridges behind him. Let us not exist anymore. We are the thousand canals in which everything also flows back again into its origin. Should I sever my own roots? Kill my own people whose king I am? Should I make my own tree wither? You really are the sons of the devil. Strike. We are servants who want to die for their master. What will happen if I strike? Then you will no longer be your brain, but will exist beyond your madness. Do you not see? Your madness is your brain. The terrible entanglement and intertwining in the connection of the roots, in the nets of canals, the confusion of fibres. Being engrossed in the brain makes you wild. Strike! He who finds the way rises up over his brain. You are a Tom Thumb in the brain. Beyond the brain, you gain the form of a giant. We are surely sons of the devil. But did you not forge us out of the hot and dark? So we have something of its nature and of yours. The devil says that everything that exists is also worthy, since it perishes. As sons of the devil, we want destruction, but as your creatures, we want our own destruction. We want to rise up in you through death. We are roots that suck up from all sides. Now you have everything that you need, therefore chop us up, tear us out. Will I miss you as servants? As a master, I need slaves. The master serves himself. You ambiguous sons of the devil, these words are your undoing. May my sword strike you, this blow shall be valid forever. What we feared, what we desired, has come to pass. I set foot on new land. Nothing brought up should flow back. No one shall tear down what I have built. My tower is of iron and has no seams. The devil is forged into the foundations. The Kabiri built it, and the master builders were sacrificed with the sword on the battlements of the tower. Just as a tower surmounts the summit of a mountain on which it stands, so I stand above my brain, from which I grew. I have become hard and cannot be undone again. No more do I flow back. I am the master of my own self. I admire my mastery. I am strong and beautiful and rich. The vast lands and the blue sky have laid themselves before me and bowed to my mastery. I wait upon no one, and no one waits upon me. I serve myself, and I myself serve. Therefore I have what I need." That was Carl Jung's writing on the human brain from the Red Book. Jung's exploration of the human mind in the Red Book echoes a historical theme seen in the legendary tale of Alexander the Great and the Gordian Knot. Jung's writings a profound delve into the complexities of the psyche stand as a modern counterpart to the ancient narrative. Just as Alexander's bold act of cutting the Gordian knot challenged convention, Jung's insights on the human brain similarly defy traditional boundaries, illustrating a shared spirit of unorthodox thinking across different epochs. Thank you for viewing.